Hello, everybody, and welcome to this CNCF webinar. Uh, we're here today to talk about um, essentially everything you need to know about Kubernetes certification. There's a number of uh, different CNCF certifications that exist in the ecosystem, and uh, we just want to give you a lot of details about what they are, um, what to expect from exams, and then some tips and tricks to get you through the process. Uh, my name is Chris Hansen. Uh, I'm a senior uh, associate consultant and uh, cloud native engineer with RxM. I'm here with my uh, colleague, Alien. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Alien, and together with Chris, we are going to teach you everything you need to know to pass successfully the Kubernetes certifications from the very first time. Very cool. So let's talk about uh, what the certifications are for those folks that aren't familiar with them. So there's really two types of certifications that exist uh, just for Kubernetes. So we're really just talking about the Kubernetes certifications. There's a whole bunch of other ones that exist. So the, the first type is a multiple choice exam. So there's two of those. The first one's known as the KCNA. Um, the CNCF calls this a pre-professional certification, which uh, essentially captures your knowledge uh, about what is cloud native? The second one is the KCSA. Now this is uh, basic knowledge of security. So you may already be in uh, in your cloud native career, your cloud native journey somewhere. And so if you're just kind of beginning your uh, security journey, this would be another example of an, of a, um, of an exam uh, that would test your knowledge of things like compliance frameworks, uh, Kubernetes hardening, those sorts of things. The next category of exams, these are performance-based. So the, the previous ones were multiple choice, right? So you're, you're really just testing your knowledge uh, and awareness of those things, uh, those topics in cloud native, either cloud native itself or security. But these are more about uh, performance. What, what that means is these are uh, exams where you have to demonstrate that you can perform tasks uh, that would be required of a particular persona, right? So there are three different uh, tests here. The CCAD, which is the application developer exam. This is the persona where uh, if you're a developer and you're using Kubernetes, you're not doing any sort of administration, but you are deploying apps on, the, um, on a Kubernetes cluster, for example. Um, and you may have some uh, some abstraction, right? Uh, uh, IDPs or, or developer portals are, are pretty popular these days. So you, there may be some abstraction between you and Kubernetes, but in this test, you have to know what those Kubernetes primitives are in order to deploy an application, right? Things like deployments and pods and config maps and secrets and things like that. Uh, the second one here is the CKA. This was actually the first exam uh, Kubernetes-based certification exam that was uh, created by the CNCF. Uh, so it's the oldest one. Um, and this is about doing administration for Kubernetes. So it's not only just uh, application primitives, but it's also deployment of clusters, configuration of clusters. So things like installing Kubernetes, how you do that, uh, things like that. And then the last one here on the slide is the CKS. Uh, this is the security specialist exam. This is one where, uh, again, you have to demonstrate your skills, uh, doing things like hardening Kubernetes, using tooling beyond Kubernetes. So this exam, unlike the CCAD and the CKA, is also going to test your knowledge on tools outside of Kubernetes that help to harden a Kubernetes cluster against any sort of attacks. So that's really the range of exams that exist from the CNCF uh, focused on Kubernetes. Now, if you're uh, like Ilian and myself, uh, and you're daring enough to do them all, uh, there is a program called the Kubesternout program. This is brand new. It was announced at uh, KubeCon in Paris. And you can see Ilian and I with our with our special jackets there. alien has got his on today. Uh, this is a special recognition for people who have um, really dedicated themselves to taking all of these exams, demonstrating their Kubernetes skill level, 
and uh, it's called the Coopsternaut program, as I mentioned. Uh, and it's really about um, having sort of like ambassadors. So if you think of the CNCF ambassador program, right? This is really about ambassadors that uh, are for the training space, right? Um, so if you take all of the, the certifications, you recognize as one of those people who has knowledge about all of these exams and um, of course have, have passed them. So you have lots of skills that you can help other folks with. And so um, the the program right now gives you a title, of course, that title scoops or not, a digital badge. So you can display that like on your LinkedIn, for example, uh, an exclusive jacket, uh, which we mentioned a moment ago. And then there are uh, upcoming discounts to CNCF events and certifications uh, coming up. And um, so it's kind of a, a cool way to recognize people. Um, and I, I don't know, Alien, I don't know about you, but I felt pretty proud to be like, you know, someone who achieved this. It's a privilege, really. Yeah. A really a great recognition. So we're going to talk a little bit about exam requirements because, again, there, there are probably a lot of questions about um, what exactly uh, we need to do for the examinations. Thank you, Chris. And that's really important for everyone preparing for an exam because there are a number of requirements, both about the environment in which we are taking those exams, the machines which we are using to run the exam environment, and also more personal um, requirements. For example, how do we behave? We are not allowed to speak. And we are also not allowed to move our lips, which I have to admit it was a challenge for me because I unconsciously move move my lips like while reading the the questions. This has been a problem for me because usually the proctor watches you, and if you do that, you can get a notification and your exam might be frozen. And if you keep doing it, they might even stop your exam. Our desks has to be really clean throughout the exam, uh, both the desks and the surrounding area. We're not allowed to have any sort of electronic devices or papers, pens, pencils, calculators. None of this is allowed. While we, we are getting admitted to the exam, we are asked to show our electronic device. And we have to demonstrate that it's put away on mute, far away from us, where we cannot reach it. We are not allowed to have any sort of food or drink on our desk as well. Um, I, I'm really used to have coffee a, a hand away. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We can only have a clear glass or bottle without a label um, and only water. No tea, no coffee, unfortunately, throughout the exam. So all objects should be removed, as we've already mentioned. One, one thing that is really interesting is that if you have a keyboard or a trackpad, you know, I'm using my Mac, usually for my exams, a number of proctors has been really curious, what is this white thing on my desk? And they ask you always to show both sides, you know, front and back, just to prove that you you're not hiding anything below it. You're not allowed to have any sort of... Um, um, you know, like school program or posters with text on it on, on your walls. They ask you to remove all of that. I've been taking the exam once for my kid's room and he had this school program on the wall, which I had to remove because it's, you know, it's not allowed. So no sticky notes or whatever, uh, on the, on, on, on the, on, on the table. But strangely enough, you know, in behind me, I used to keep an art that my wife has painted. They've never made problem with that, luckily. So at least arts and, and paintings you can, you can keep. Um, the room where we are taking the exam from has to be well lit. Our face has to be clearly visible. Although once I took an exam where the light above me has burned out and I just had the, the backlight illuminating the, the room, it, they, they haven't made me a problem about that. But you know, you cannot make the exam from a dark room <laughs> overnight during the night or something. Yeah, you know, uh, 
And one of the times that I took an exam, I my my desk is messy. Like, you know, it's just messy. So I'm like, I'm gonna avoid trying to clean up my desk to, you know, I I'll just go on the couch, right? In in the, our yeah. spare room. And uh, before the the test or the the area check was over, pretty much all the 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 cushions were off the couch on the floor, right? Because mm. uh, they want to make sure that I'm not, you know, stuffing things in the cushions, which makes sense, right? So, but I thought I was going to get away with, you know, <laughs> not having to do all that, and it would, you know, and it turned out it was just as much uh, trouble to. Um, Put all the, you know, tear the couch apart and put it all back together. I should have just cleaned my my desk, honestly. <laughs> I always prefer to go on somebody else's desk or in my office where it's much cleaner at home. And I just keep as as you do this creative chaos around me. I I, I have a lot of stuff and I know why it's there and where I can find it, but they they don't like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> so during the exam, you'll be on your own, but luckily you are allowed to use some resources. So you don't have to memorize, you know, uh, to, 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 to know all the commands, what the, all the command options, the, the structures of the various YAML documents or whatever. You can use a few resources, but they are more than enough to pass the exam. Still, you have to be careful. There is this drawback that if you get away spending too much time looking inside the documentation these can easily eat up from your time so for the cka and ckd exam um, because there, there might be questions about helm you you have access to the helm documentation to the kubernetes documentation portal and the kubernetes block no other resources no other web pages are allowed even um, if you try to type, you know, Kubernetes IO dot forward slash docs and you make a typo, uh, you get a warning on your browser that you are visiting an allowed site and you'll be presented with the list of allowed domains that you can use throughout the exams. If English is not your foreign language, as it is for me, you can maybe, you know, guess by my accent, you can take the... Um, uh, the exam in multiple language, but you can also access the documentation in multiple languages. So you can, you know, easily find in the documentation pages what you're looking for. For the CKS exam, which is considered at least for me a bit harder than the others, definitely harder. <laughs> um, you're allowed to use some additional resources. The exam itself asks you not only about the security functionalities that are building inside Linux itself and Kubernetes exposes, but also about um, third-party tools in the cloud native ecosystem that can be used to additionally harden your environment, harden your deployment, scan your images. You know, tools like Trivi, Falco, the questions about etcd, which is the key value data store used um, uh, by Kubernetes. For those, you are allowed to access their documentation. For example, you can go into the Trivi um, documentation section or the Falco one, and uh, you can look how the, you can write rules um, for Falco or you can how you can use Trivi to scan your image. Again, don't get distracted. I can give you a quick tip right here. Falco, for example, has really nice built-in documentation on the command line. You can just type Falco minus, minus list, and it will give you all the uh, key, uh, keywords that you can use for creating a rule. You know, most of the time, you can just copy-paste the rules and just modify them the way that the question requires. So tips like that you can use to save a lot of time. Never use the documentation when you can get the answer using a CLI tool. That's a great um, tip. Yeah. yeah, and there are also things that you can do for etcd and Kubernetes API server. They both run inside containers, but you can execute their binaries with minus help option from within the container, which will dump the whole documentation inside the console. And you can redirect that to a text file and grab against this text file. You know, I would say like 80 or 90% of the questions you can answer just getting the COI you know, help rather than having to switch to a browser. The main 
problem I have is first the connection from this VNC environment might be slow. The pages may take a bit of time to load. Right? VNC is not really dynamic. And also the speed from this virtual machine to the internet might also be limited. So avoid using the documentation as much as you can. This will save you time. And then also you have access to the AppArmor documentation if, in, in case you need to check something. Usually the, you know, the systems are prepared for AppArmor and you just have to know, for example, how to activate it on a certain node, for example. And that leads us into our next topic, because oftentimes people are sort of curious, like, what that looks like. And the nice thing is the folks over at the CNCF have have given us some examples. And we're going to go through those because it does help uh, as you go in to understand, like, you know, if you if you go into this environment and it's suddenly, you know, completely unfamiliar... It's going to take you a little bit to familiarize yourself with that environment. And you may think like, well, you know, I want to open this documentation and this documentation and this documentation. Then you have all these browser tabs open and yeah. the environment gets a little bit stressed, right? So, this, I mean, these are temporary environments that are just spun up for your yeah. test environment. So they're not going to be, you know, a huge machine with tons of resources. They're going to be just enough for you to get through your test for that mm -hmm. temporary period of a couple hours. So uh, there's two, of course, there's two different types of uh, tests. So there's really two types of environments. So let's talk about the, the exam UI for the multiple choice exams. A couple things you'll notice, right, that are uh, surrounded in red boxes is navigation. So in the bottom left of this, you've got your previous next questions. So you can go back and forth, right? If, if, if you need to skip something, uh, it's not like if you don't answer a question, then that's it, right? You're locked into not answering that question. That's not true, right? You can go to the next question without answering one before and then go back. Um, you may want to flag it for review. So over on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a little toggle for flagging that for review so that you can give yourself a little note, right? Hey, I'm, I need to go back to go... Um, uh, make sure I review this question. Some quick tip here: if you don't, if you're not really sure about which is the correct answer, just flag it. You might go through other questions down the road that are asked in a way that give you an idea what might be the correct answer to this question that you wasn't sure about. So, um, after you go through all the questions and answer those for which you are hundred percent sure. You can always review those, as we see in the, in the next slide, and then get back and review or focus on those that you want to continue working. Right. I mean, that's such a great tip because if you don't flag it and you're like, oh, now I know that answer, what question was that? <laughs> right. Yeah. You're like, so many questions down the line, you you have no idea that maybe where it was. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's nice to be able to flag these and like go back to them, right? So yeah, this is an example of all of the items that you can review before you're done uh, with the exam. And again, nothing set in stone. So until you click that and you see that on this uh, slide, the very bottom right-hand corner, finish exam, that's when you can't go back. Now, the performance-based exams are a little bit different. Um, you're gonna have a browser that is really gonna be split because uh, you have to be able to actually type commands into clusters that exist uh, in the cloud. And so you can see here, it's split really into two panes. The left-hand side is your question and all the related information about the question. Uh, really, they, they call them tasks at this point because it's, a, it, it's not asking you something, it's saying, Go do this, right? And you have to go do it. And then the right-hand side of it is your remote desktop session, right? So you are remoted into a cloud system and it's going to have icons on the desktop. It's going to have like notepad. It's going to have a console terminal emulator, as you can see here, circled in red. And that's where you're going to interact with the remote uh, systems, right? The, the Kubernetes systems. Um, note also here that there's ways to go between tasks, 
right? So in the left-hand column toward the top, you can see this says task two of 15, and that's a drop-down menu that allows you to pick one of the tasks uh, from the list. Uh, you can also go pre you know, forward and back with the previous and, and next buttons. Um, so again, nothing set in stone here, just like the um, multiple choice questions until you end the exam at the at the very end, right? And, uh, and this interface, that's uh, kind of in the upper right uh, portion just above the, the, the RDP session here. Or you run out of time. So always keep an eye on that green bar showing the remaining time. They're going to pop up some warnings like you have half an hour, I think, or maybe 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Keep an eye on the time and where you are. Um, it might be beneficial just to give up on a task altogether or a, sub, a, a subtask and move on to the next one. You might know the answer to that one. The most important thing in my perspective is the way we copy paste, right? On this left pane where are the tasks, some parts of the, of the task descriptions are highlighted. Those sections you can click on and the content is automatically copied. But there are also other things that you can do. For example, um, if you click on the file menu in the in the terminal, there is a properties option from where you can configure the copy paste behavior. Avoid typing. If you can copy paste the name of a resource specifically, do it. It's quicker, and you avoid the risk of uh, you know introducing a typo which could um, lead to a situation where you've created the correct resource, but a slightly different name. And as the automated uh, you know, validation script expects exact match, you might not, might not get the score, or you might not get the point. Right? So look out for those things. And one more thing, maybe as we are looking at it right here, we mentioned it later on, but it's really nicely visible. You see this scroll bar. Um, for the left pane that is listing the tasks. Some questions have multiple subtasks. So it might you might think, okay, I've I've solved task subtask one and two. I should be done, right? I can go to the next question. But the slide bar might be in the upper position. So if you scroll down, they might be subtask hiding below at the end. Always look out for doors because this might be unpleasant way to lose easy points, right? So yeah, that's a good point. Um, you want to you want to make sure you complete the task entirely, not just part of it. Now that being said, though, um, we know that there's partial credit for some of the scoring. So let's say this does happen to you, right? You complete half a task and you think you did everything. It does, it's not like you're going to get zero. You're just no. going to miss out on some of the points that you would have gotten for a complete answer. Exactly. Right? Yeah, correct. On that as well, when I took the CK the last time, um, which was back in January, one of the things I really liked was that on the left-hand pane toward the top, the question would say, um, these are the domains or these are the topics that are related to this question. Yeah. And let's say the question was about um, persistent volume claims. That mm. was actually a clickable link. And that would open up the Kubernetes documentation to that specific page. And that was a nice way of uh, saving a little bit of time rather than having to search on that topic. Because I remember when I took the CKA many, many years ago, that wasn't a feature. So it was a, it was a pleasant surprise to me to see that uh, as something that was such a huge time saver. Um, I would say the danger of that is if you, you, know, you click one of those, it opens a new tab, and then you go to the next task and you click it at the next one and it opens a new tab and then you go to the third question and the fourth question pretty soon you've got 10 tabs open right yeah. and that's where you might see some uh some issues with the testing environment just be careful right when you're done with it with those make sure you close them yeah it can get pretty messy pretty quick because you're always nervous and trying to be quick you know i've come up with a couple more tips that actually might be helpful for each task on the left-hand side, they explicitly mention you have to complete this task on this specific Kubernetes cluster. Throughout the exam, you have a bunch of Kubernetes clusters different on which you have to execute specific tasks. 
if you execute correctly a specific task on the wrong cluster, <laughs> this could cause you a problem. First, you're not going to get your points, but second, this could be a problem for another task coming later on. So always keep an eye for every task on which cluster it should be executed. So this is like um, maybe my OCD or habit. Every time I switch the task, I just copy paste the command to switch to that Kubernetes context, even if it's the same one, right? I just want to uh, avoid situation where I'm too distracted by the, the, the question. By the way, I have the same, we must have the same OCD because I did the same thing, which is every time I click on that, use context command and make sure I run it, even if I know it's the same cluster. So no, that's- Better I think save that's the story, thing. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, what the exams are gonna cover. So uh, the CNCF publishes some curriculum about these exams and uh, that's, you know, um, something we want to go over, talk a little bit about what's covered in each one of the exams. Maybe if you're wondering from where to start, for example, this would be a good point to, to get an initial understanding what these certifications are about and maybe what order would make sense for you to, to start taking them. Yeah, exactly. And, um, also if, uh, the way these are broken up, we're looking at the KCNA right now, but the way these are broken up is essentially domains with uh, subjects or like in the case of the, um, in the performance-based exam, the, again, tasks that are going to be related to those domains. So if you're looking at the curriculum and you're looking at the different tasks or subjects that are going to be tested and you're not familiar with something, well, then that should be something you should definitely prioritize familiarizing yourself with, right? So uh, let's look at the KCNA uh, curriculum here. So uh, we, uh, we've got five different domains uh, with different subjects underneath them. Um, now we didn't, in all these cases, we didn't uh, include every single task or uh, subject underneath it. Uh, this is more of a summary. If you want to get the full set of curriculum and uh, tasks or or subjects related to each one of the domains, you should definitely go to the CNCF's GitHub for that. We wanted to at least give you some examples of things that uh, were from the curriculum for each domain, right? Uh, these can be pretty long and comprehensive. Uh, for the KCNA, not, not as much, but as you see, we start to get deeper into like the CKS is a lot of stuff to cover. So first up here in the top left here is Kubernetes fundamentals. So this is really, you know, what Kubernetes is. The second one here, container orchestration, talks a little bit more about uh, containers, uh, container security, networking, service mesh things, and storage. The third one is cloud native application delivery. So this is really about GitOps. What are the concepts? Like, what is GitOps, right? What does it mean um, to have a GitOps workflow. What 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 is CI and CD? Like what what do those things do? What do those tools do? The fourth category here in the top right is cloud native architecture. Uh, this again goes back to concepts of things like auto scaling, how we do auto scaling uh, via metrics, things like that. Some of the community and governance uh, um, that's in the open source community. Different personas. Uh, we talked about some personas like developers and things like that. Uh, even the performance-based exams are based on those. Different open standards. So you have to think about uh, things like the OCI and other types of standards that exist within the community. And then the last one here is cloud native observability. So looking at the telemetry and observability aspects of cloud native uh, tools like Prometheus. So if you're not familiar with that, go take a look at what Prometheus is. And then uh, including cost management making sure that we're only paying for what we actually need to pay for or what we're actually using, not deploying lots of stuff. So being able to do uh, understand those concepts. The second one here being the KCSA. So this again is security-based. So starting with the top left, uh, the overview of cloud-native security. So uh, for example here, this would be the four Cs of cloud-native security. So you need to be, un you need to understand uh, the definition of those four Cs, uh, I would suggest, you know, reading things like 
uh, the cloud native security white paper that came from the cloud native computing foundation, maybe even the, um, the secure software factory that also came from uh, SIG or tag security. The next domain would be Kubernetes cluster component security. So essentially hardening, right? What are the control plane components? What are the node agents that run in a Kubernetes cluster uh, and how we harden those things? Uh, for this particular domain. Uh, third domain here would be security fundamentals. So this is looking at things like pod security standards, pod security admission, understanding uh, what those things are, things like security contexts, so that we can enforce that a pod uh, is deployed with a minimum set of security uh, settings, right? Fourth uh, domain here in the top right is the Kubernetes threat model. So understanding different attacks uh, that can happen with Kubernetes. You know, there's some examples here, uh, denial of service, access to sensitive data, privilege escalation attempts, and, and understanding what controls are in place to prevent those types of attacks on Kubernetes. Uh, fifth one here, uh, just below that, platform security. So of course, our platforms aren't just Kubernetes, but they're often lots of different tools, right? So supply chain security, if we've got other upstream build tools that we're using, CI platforms uh, and concepts surrounding supply chain security. Uh, some of the security provided by things like service meshes, what uh, additional security we get on top of Kubernetes if we're using something like Istio or Linkerd or something like that. Uh, lastly, here is compliance and security frameworks. So really understanding threat modeling frameworks. This is where things like uh, MITRE and things come into play um, so that we understand what those frameworks are and we can um, use them to our advantage so that uh, we can kind of practice uh, doing things like understanding an attack and the mitigation to that attack. Hey Chris, while we're here, maybe we can comment on those percents that are percentages that are related with each category. Because I think this is yeah, really, really important to to realize for the exam. Yeah, that's true. Uh, each one of the domains uh, has a certain amount of weight to it. You can see those percentages. Good point. I sort of skipped over that with the KCNA. But uh, of course, in this case, you know, the um, Component security, security fundamentals are both have 22%. So you're going to see that they're going to have um, a more more emphasis, right, on, on these two domains than other things. Uh, do you want to talk about the CCAD, Elian? Yeah, sure. So here we have also five categories, like application, design, and build. So in this first category, um, the... the, the um, you know, candidates have to demonstrate skills, how to build container images, um, how to use different controllers like jobs, cron jobs, deployments, stuff like that to actually create managed pods in the Kubernetes environments. Then um, application deployment, another category with 20% weight is, is regarding the common deployment strategies. When we deploy applications, you know, quite often we have to deal with situation where we have to do upgrades. The next category emphasize on the connectivity, not only between the applications that we deploy, but also the ways those applications are accessed from outside of the Kubernetes environments, maybe from the other uh, servers running virtual machines in the same uh, internal network, or maybe from external networks as well. The next section uh, regarding observability and maintenance is also very important because once we deploy the applications, we want to be able to see what is going on with them. So here we have to demonstrate knowledge uh, about things like API deprecations, uh, health checks and props, then uh, other things that we have to demonstrate knowledge is the way that we uh, monitor our um, applications 
you know how we how we can access the logs of these applications and how we debug issues with our workloads based on these various mechanisms that exist. So finally, the final category is regarding uh, application environments, configuration, and security. Um, when we package our application and deploy it, we have to be able to demonstrate that we can configure this application because we don't want to package the application with its configuration to make it portable. We have to separate the application from the configuration. And Kubernetes offers a number of ways that we can manage not only the configuration, but also the way um, the the access to this application is done. So here we have a little bit of security also covered in this section, like how we do uh, authentication, authorization, also admission control. You notice that different exams, they overlap a little bit with each other. In the previous two exams, you know, in the, the security KCNS, uh, there were more like theory kind of questions. And here in CKAD, we have to actually put that in practice and demonstrate how we use this functionality. Here, although this is not security focused exam, we also have to demonstrate some basic knowledge about the Kubernetes security mechanisms and how we can use them as a developer to secure our applications. So I'm gonna take the CKA because I really want Elian to talk uh, about the CKS. So, uh... So let's talk about the CKA. So when we talk about RBAC here in the first domain under cluster architecture installation and configuration, uh, we're talking about creating uh, roles and role bindings for things like users uh, so that we can grant users access to a cluster, whereas the CCAD may just focus on how does an application access the Kubernetes API. We have to worry about both of those things as administrators, right? We have to think about how do we grant access to users and applications, because it's really some overlap there, but it's more about uh, humans as well as applications. Because of the fact that we have to deploy clusters, we have to deploy via installers, right? We have to ins install it, we have to upgrade it, we have to make sure that it's distributed via high availability. Now, again, install tools are great, right? Like you can use COPS, you can use KubeSpray, you can use you know lots of different install tools but again, these things are abstractions. Oftentimes they'll use tooling like kubeadmin under the covers, right? They don't, they may not say that to you, but they might use it. They may not. But I know, for example, like COPS uses it. So if you're very used to COPS and you're like, well, I know how to install Kubernetes. I just use COPS. Again, nope, that's not really the Kubernetes reference way to do it. You have to understand how to do it directly with kubeadmin by interacting with the kubeadmin binary on a node. Right, and that's true for upgrades. Just a quick tip here, Chris. Um, this kind of questions, and you might or might not have one, but if you ask to do an upgrade, first be really careful from which version to which target version you're upgrading. You know, there are some rules here that apply. Of course, you cannot skip major versions, for example. But also keep in mind the time again, because this is a multi-stepped process that might be really time time intensive. You might as well lose maybe 10 minutes to complete this task if you're asked to do it. So really plan it, for example, only if you have time, maybe leave it for the for the end as well. Yeah, I, I always leave it for the end myself <laughs> because yeah, it's going to take you longer than the average question. And yeah. some of them are going to, uh, essentially you want to bank some time, right? with easier questions that you know you can do quickly. Yeah. So yeah, good good point. Uh, next, next one, services and networking. So again, uh, you have to understand how networking is set up through the Kubernetes, uh, uh, th through the nodes, right? Because it's the kubelet that has to communicate with the CNI plugins. So you have to understand that. As well, you have to understand the different service types because we want to be able to expose applications uh, make sure they have networking and then make sure we expose them to clients, whether those are internal or external clients, uh, as well as giving, uh, understanding how to deal with core DNS because that's our Kubernetes DNS service. Uh, last category here in the bottom left, uh, workloads and scheduling. 
So again, there's a little bit of overlap here. Deployments, rolling updates, rollbacks. We saw that in the CCAT. Um, so very similar questions here regarding that. Config maps and secrets, again, also seen in the CCAT. The two other bullets are on the right. Scheduling and resource limits and then uh, manifest management. So there is, a again, some, some overlap. Going over to the right column at the top, storage. Now note, there is a disparity here, right? Storage is really only 10% of the total test here, whereas things like uh, troubleshooting, the next category is very uh, is the is the most time that you'll spend, right? Because that's really oftentimes what SREs will spend their time on, right? Is de is debugging issues with the cluster, debugging issues with the application. So in storage, we just simply uh, look at the different primitives and make sure that we understand the how those primitives are set up through things like volume modes and access modes, right? PVCs, PVs, that sort of thing, and making sure that we can set up our clusters with uh, appropriate storage classes. Uh, so last category here, troubleshooting. So this is where we need to know, understand, like how do we troubleshoot our cluster components? Uh, how do we get logs from our nodes, right? It's gonna be different depending on how the cluster is deployed and then being able to figure out if something's broken, what messages it's sending us, and fixing that issue uh, so that we can get a, a, a hamstring cluster back up and running to full. Um, I will say also one other thing to note here with CKA is that there is some reliance upon Linux tooling, uh, more so than uh, like the CCAD. Like the CCAD is all... Um, you're going to be in using kubectl the whole time. But with the CKA, because we are dealing with infrastructure, um, if you don't know apt, for example, right, the reference platform for all of these tests is Ubuntu 2004. Okay, moving on to the CKS. Before you are allowed to take the CKS exam, you have to have CKA. Right? They will not allow you to schedule CKS without valid CKA. Then the CKS exam is split into these six topics. Um, you are asked how you set up the cluster, but then the main emphasis is how to set it up from the security point of view, how you harden your cluster. You are asked to use the CS benchmark, and then this benchmark can give you some recommendations. So you have to know how to use these recommendations properly to harden your cluster. Um, you asked here to demonstrate how you can secure ingress, for example, how you can do TLS termination on your ingress, how you can protect some metadata and endpoints, verify binaries. You know, this is really important in the context of the supply chain security. Then the next topic also related to cluster hardening is how to protect the heart, the, the core of Kubernetes, which is its API. Then you have to demonstrate knowledge and skills using role-based access control to limit access to certain resources of Kubernetes. Um, you have to be aware about using service accounts um, and what implications for the security they have. Then there are some more um, uh, subjects regarding minimize, uh, hardening the platform itself, right? The, the system on which Kubernetes run, the individual nodes, right? For example, how to minimize the footprint on the, on the hosts, right? The main point is to use as much resources from these machines for running your workloads and leave the you know overhead by Kubernetes and various agents to minimum. Um, then uh, identity access management roles, um, how to minimize the external access to the network to protect external entities from gaining access to various Kubernetes applications and uh, workloads running there. And a uh, big point of that is how to use these built-in security subsystems of the Linux kernel. SE Linux, 
app armor, secure computing. Um, the questions might sound scary, they really aren't. So then the next category is about vulnerabilities in the microsystems, uh, microservices. And this is one of the more important sections together with the supply chain security and monitoring, logging, you know, observability, basically. Um, so here in this uh, microservice vulnerability section, we emphasize on managing Kubernetes secrets. This is a Kubernetes resource that allows us to protect sensitive configurations like certificates, for example, over IAS keys, how we can you know, protect artifacts and um, files basically on the OS level, how we can protect the host, um, how we can isolate the different workloads running on our Kubernetes cluster, right? Here, the emphasis is that not all container runtimes are the same. Then the next category is regarding the supply chain security, which is like a focal point for the whole community in the past couple of years. This category, uh, we, we are asked to prove that we can um, scan our images, we can identify vulnerabilities in our images, and we can do actions based on that. Either um, do something with the workloads that uses them, or just choose you know, images that don't have them. We ask to demonstrate how we scan images, um, how we sign images. And then just a quick tip here, if you have a little bit of experience doing shell scripting for this kind of questions, uh, for example, how you can efficiently grab or output the result from uh, a tool in a JSON and use tools like JQ, this can, this can save us a lot of time. And you can save a lot of time in this kind of question using using a little bit of scripting, right? So then there are things like static analysis, analysis of user workloads, you know, uh, um, tools that you can use to uh, identify issues, or you can be asked, which are some of the funniest questions, um, you know, point where the problem is. You have a bunch of, for example, of resources, and you have to identify the one having issues. I really love those ones, you know, yeah, just just by reading them. You know. Then final category is regarding monitoring, logging, and runtime security. Again, observability is big part. You 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 know, a big part of the the security concept is to not only scan before. You deploy the workloads, but also be aware of what is happening in your environment while the workloads are running. So there are a, a number of really cool questions here, like to uh, using demonstrate knowledge of using tools like SysDig or Falco. So really interesting, challenging exam. I would say maybe my favorite because it's so challenging because the broad scope so many technologies and tools that you have to demonstrate knowledge while taking the exam my recommendation is try to be familiar with the tools most of the tools will give you a hint what you have to do right for example you don't have to know how to create a complete falco policy Maybe you can just use an existing one and modify it in a way that matches what you expect it to do. Or maybe you might use SysDig with correct CLI options and achieve the same outcome, right? In these kind of questions, they don't really, you know, they don't have an opinion which tool you, you, you use as long as you reach the same conclusions, the correct outcome, right? So you might choose the the tool that works best for you, and then use it. You're flexible in this regard. Right, and that that's a good point, and that kind of leads us into our tips and tricks, tips and tricks question, or section rather. What matters is is the end answer, right? How you got there doesn't matter as much. So that's one of the first tricks uh, we or one of the first tips we talked about. Uh, we want to talk about some more tips and tricks to help you succeed. Uh, we we alluded to this a little bit. Get to the end as fast as possible, right? So um, how do you do that? This is, again, you have the ability in the 
uh, in the interface to go back and forth between questions. So nothing's set in stone until you end the exam. So if you don't immediately know the answer to a question, then it's probably worth skipping, right? And leaving it for flex time toward the end because you're going to know right after you read the question uh, that you know how to solve something. And if you don't, you don't want to spend a bunch of, you know, a bunch of time that you really don't have uh, answering that question at the sake of other things you could have answered quickly, but you ran out of time. One of the bullets here talks about a simple strategy, right? Like finish the first pass of all your questions, completing and skipping questions in the first, let's say 75 minutes. Uh, this is more for like the performance-based exams. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, you just change the time parameter for the first pass of your questions to fit the one and a half hours if you're talking about the multiple choice. Get through them all, right? Because if you don't know what's down the line, you don't know, you know, what you're going to be answering. Then spend that extra flex time revisiting the questions or debugging in the last 45 minutes. I remember the last time I took the CKA, uh, one of the RBAC questions, I knew I did it right, but I couldn't confirm it, right? That's one of the things is like you often want to check right that you've done it correctly and i couldn't confirm it and i'm and i just couldn't give up on it but i'm like okay i got to move on from this and then i answered all the other things i wanted to answer and so i had a bunch you know not a ton of time but i had a decent amount of time left that i could go back to that rbac question and i could like work out well why can't i confirm this right and it ended up that i just was using command syntax wrong right for the confirmation part of it so I had mm. got would have gotten it right. Yeah, in the context of this tip, sorry, uh, so I just wanted to mention that a big part of passing successfully the exam is the correct mindset and strategy. If you know very early on what kind of questions you have ahead of you, and you end up in a situation where you have time pressure, right? You realize that I don't have enough time to you know, answer all the questions. And you, if you know what other questions you have ahead of you, you can prioritize based on criteria like which is part of this category with the highest weight. Maybe for this question, I'll get more points. Uh, which one I'm confident how to solve quickly, right? So you can jump back and prioritize those ones. Um, or maybe if you know that one, maybe will take us me the least amount of time. This is also another criteria uh, based on which you can strategically, you know, time box, you know, your remaining time to address those ones. And again, you don't have to, you know, answer them all. You just prioritize um, answering those you you know the answers, and also those that will give you the most amount of points. Right. And one of the things we didn't mention in the we we're talking about the UI, but that does tell you what the percentage is, what the value of the question, yeah. right? So if mm -hmm. you have really high confidence and you go through, maybe you review everything you've answered and gone, okay, do the math, right? Like, uh, I know this one was worth X percent and Y percent and Z percent at the end, and you've answered everything else and you have one or two questions that you just don't know what to do right? Start to use the documentation and try and do a couple of steps of it and get a little bit of credit for it, right? If you have that extra time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to answer all the tasks. Pick up just the tasks from the remaining questions and those will give you some points. Right. Yep. Uh, the other general tip here is pick the fastest way you know how to solve a question, right? You're not great at how you get there. We talked about this. Uh, use the tools, yep. use the commands, use the flags. You already know, right? Use the toolkit you've already got. Don't use the toolkit that you think they want you to use, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, be familiar with, and that's why we say like, you know, if you're not familiar with Ubuntu, that's the reference platform. Make sure that you get a little practice on with Ubuntu. But of course, you know, the tools on top of Ubuntu are largely the same in a lot of Linux distros. So if you already have knowledge of those things, then use those to your advantage, right? Uh, the last one here on this slide, don't write YAML, 
right? There are a lot of ways that Kubernetes can write YAML for you. There's the dry run flag, the minus O YAML outputter. There's the documentation, right? So either make the CLI write the manifests for you or use an example. Uh, don't spend time writing YAMLs. Uh, the, the most you want to do is edit something, right? So uh, this is one of the things that I call the drum brake theory from when I learned to work on cars, right? Car has drum brakes. You always leave one together, right? Because when you take the other brake apart, there's pieces everywhere. Drum brakes are insanely complicated. And you have this piece in your hand, like, I don't know where this goes. You go around to the other side and you look at the example that you left together you're like, oh, that's where that goes. And you put it. So here's the thing. All the clusters that are there, all of the other pods, all of the other uh, resources that are in all the other clusters, those are examples for you, right? You can output with an outputter uh, any other pod or deployment or anything else in the cluster as an example. So you don't even need to like go find an example in the docs, right? It's right in front of you. And so make Absolutely. use Kubernetes as as that example. One more tip. One more tip. Um, validation might eat a lot of time. Don't be crazy with that. But I will still highly recommend you to do very quick validation. Um, uh, the, I'm saying that in the context of what Chris was just saying. In my previous example, for example, I was creating a Kubernetes resource that was a requirement to deploy a pod. And if I wouldn't check really quickly that my pod is not in running state, it was pending, I wouldn't know that I have actually created this YAML file, but I haven't applied it. So always make sure you not only create these YAML specs, manifest, but also apply them. Otherwise, you will not get any points because it's not on the server. Right, yeah. That's a good point. Validation is... Uh, you can go down a rabbit hole, but yeah, you, you probably want to make sure that you actually did the thing they asked you to do. Yeah. All right. So practicing, let's talk about you know, practicing. So as part of your test uh, purchase, right? Yeah. Uh, they give you killer SH. So uh, back when I did the early versions of uh, the CKA, they didn't have killer SH. So Ilan, you want to talk about your experience with this? Well, when I was taking my exams, it was already present and I'm really grateful for that. QRSH is really awesome environment, not exactly like the lab environment, but it gives you very close look and feel. And then um, they have a, a number of questions. If I'm not wrong, the last time there were like 24 questions. Some of them were still in you know, like a beta phase. And those questions in this uh, environment, in this playground, were usually much harder the than the question that you would usually get in the real exam. And this is done by intention. If you learn how to solve quickly the harder questions with more subtasks, then you have absolutely no problem of, you know, solving the the, the the tasks in the real exam. In QRSH, we get two sessions as part of our exam package. Um, each session is valid for 36 hours, which means that after we activate the session, we have 36 hours to do as many attempts to pass the exam in this playground as we want. What I'm usually doing is activating this playground, usually the day before the exam or the previous day, and try to get my mindset, keep in mind all the commands from the COI, all the tricks, how to how to be efficient and productive and quick. And I, I don't pass this question, uh, this set of questions only once, but I try to do it over and over again. At one point, it's like, you know, finger muscle memory that guides me through solving them. It's already all in your head. And this helps a lot during the during the real exam. In these playgrounds, besides the questions, they usually provide you in QRSH they do, they provide you the answer as well. So after the end of your session, you can keep working 
but you'll be notified that you're out of time, for example. And then when you decide I'm done, they can grade your attempt and they can tell you, okay, this question you've answered correctly, that question was wrong uh, or wrongly answered. And here are the answers. You can compare your approach with their approach. So you can also improve your, your knowledge uh, uh, as, you, as you practice. By the time I was, you know, ready to take my exam, I was solving all 25 questions for like 90 minutes, right? So if you can do it for less time than the simulator gives you, the real exam gives you, you have absolutely no problem in the real exam. Let me quickly also mention the other playground, QRCoder.com. It's actually a project from the same author that created the CKA, if I'm not wrong, um, uh, exam in QRSH. Uh, QR Coder is really nice. It includes a lot of sections with individual uh, individual tasks to solve. QRSH is more like a package. You get a set of tasks for CK, CK, D, and CKS. In QR Coder, they also have like categories, but in those categories, they are just grouping of questions regarding certain subject, for example. A specific exam or specific technology. And you can always access QR code. There is no restriction. There is no certain number of sessions you're entitled to. I, I remember during the last KubeCon in Paris, they've announced we have this KubeCon, uh, not KubeCon, but Kubernetes cluster that you can quickly spin. And for example, while you're listening at you know, a presentation or a workshop, you can do the exercises right there in QR Coder. Um, QR Coder environments are more dynamic. So after an hour, they are disposed of. So keep that in mind. In QRSH, you can, your work is preserved for up to 36 hours. In QR Coder, after an hour, it will be um, stopped, your machine, and your work will be lost. Makes sense. Uh, some other ways to prepare for the uh, exam include some of the uh, training that the Linux Foundation uh, offers in terms of self-paced training. So uh, there are a number of different courses that we we wanted to mention um, that are available. So uh, the first one here listed is the LFS 158. So if you're new to Kubernetes and you want to know uh, just more about it, this is a self-paced 15 hours uh, course that's free. Uh, online that you can take. Uh, and then there are uh, three self-paced trainings specifically aimed at the different personas, right? So CK, CK, and CKS. Each one of these, now these are not free, they are paid, uh, but they're online, they're self-paced, you've got about 35 hours of content. And it has hands-on labs that you can do um, through these courses. Now, if you're looking for instructor-led training, uh, the uh, Linux Foundation also offers instructor-led training. Um, so there are, again, three courses for those. Uh, this is uh, instructor-led training delivered either online, so you can do virtual. Uh, they also do in-person classes periodically, uh, and there's a schedule for all of these uh, by Linux Foundation instructors or an authorized training partner. We know this because uh, RxM, we're an authorized training partner, and we have delivered uh, Linux Foundation courses before. We also have our own courses. Uh, we call them boot camps. So we offer live instructor-led uh, online, again, virtual or in-person certification boot camps. Uh, we offer five-day boot camps for things like the CKA, the CCAD, and the CKS to get you prepared. Uh, actually, the CCAD is, is only four days. Um, but they're essentially about a week long uh, as public courses for folks. And then for the um, the CKA, the CCAD, and the CKS, we also offer one-day exam preps. So if you're already um, familiar, right, the, the boot camp is going to sort of take you from zero to being prepared to take the exam. But the exam prep, if you're already kind of no Kubernetes, and you just want to uh, get exam tips, practice, right? Because one of the tips we're going to 
see in uh, a subsequent slide here is practice, right? Practice all the time. That's really what's going to get you uh, to get your speed up, right? As Alien was talking about his own personal um, experience with uh, Killer SH, right? Just having that, the ability to have those hand, the hands on some environment. And uh, the nice thing about these exam practices is their structure, right? Is that we'll take you through different questions. Again, very much like uh, an exam. Of course, they're not exa actual exam questions because we can't do that, but they're exam-like and we'll get you in that kind of thought process and get you to work through those problems with an instructor. And then there's a lot of sharing about like how how did you achieve the um, the answer to the question, right? That sort of thing. And our, our boot camp at the end includes the exam prep. So both our boot camps uh, our, our five day or our four to five day boot camps have the exam prep at the end, but we also just offer those single day. Or we have the K KCNA and KCSA two day boot camps, which also include kind of a a, a multiple choice type of uh, thing at the end. So those get you familiarized with uh, the subjects of the KCNA or KCSA, and then we have like kind of uh, multiple choice types of. Uh, exam prep at the end of those. So it often can be helpful to learn from somebody who uh, has experience right, with the tooling, uh, that has more experience with the tests. And that can be from a Linux Foundation um, instructor. We can do it. Uh, matter of fact, most of the folks on the RxM team contributed to one of the tests uh, in some in some shape or form uh like i actually i've never actually taken the cks because i helped write it so uh i'm sort of excluded from doing that um but i know a lot about that test because of course i was on the committee that that helped write it so uh that can be an advantage if you want to learn in a lot of cases now let's talk about some other uh preparation tips uh, oh hey there's that first bullet do as much hands-on practice as you can right uh, because you, you need that repetition. You got to get, you may be really great with Kubernetes, right? You may know, have a lot of knowledge, but it's really the time, right? Alien? The delivery, right? That That's why I was referencing this muscle memory because um, during the exam, you try to shave any second from, from running a command, right? You look for techniques like setting environment variables, creating aliases. And if you have a practice, you don't have to think, okay, what was that subcommand? It was, was it uh, kubectl run or kubectl create? This adds up over the, over the question. So repetition and continuous practice, especially uh, the days prior to the exam that's really, really valuable for the exam itself. Can help a lot. Uh, the next bullet here, we really talked about already, uh, making sure you practice against the Kubernetes version. So, you know, we've talked about techniques for that. I'll skip over that. And then uh, the last one, get familiar with the proctoring interface. Hopefully we've given you a little bit of that information. There are some custom customization capabilities that are there. Um, so knowing that a little bit of, you know, how that's set up as you go in, <laughs> will help you uh, speed it up a little bit. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people. Sorry, I've seen a lot, a lot of people talking about how you customize Vim, uh, opening VimRC to customize the tabs and spaces and stuff like that. You know, in my opinion, that is a little bit overkill. The the optimizations that you have out of the box are really great baseline. Um, depending on your taste, you might enable just copy paste, copy by selection. Yeah, no, it, you don't have a lot of time. So the more time you spend custom no. customizing things, the less time you're going to have to actually do them. So let's keep going with the exam tips. So uh, the first one here really is about the proctoring, right? So there's a lot of um, validation that has to be done. You've got to validate your ID, you have to do the scan of your room and all of those things. And it takes some time, right? So it makes sense just just show up a little bit earlier and get all the preliminaries out of the way, for sure. Uh, the next one is taking breaks. Um, you can take breaks if you need to you know, get up and use the bathroom or whatever it might be. Uh, one thing to note, the timer does not stop. 
So extra tip, use the bathroom before the beginning of the exam. You can save a couple of minutes yeah. this way. <laughs> Uh, last last one here on this page is getting disconnected from your exam. Uh, I know in my exam, I piped Vim to grep and blew the whole thing up. <laughs> and uh, I still could get out. I, it still was okay. I, I don't know. I think I was trying to type cat and I just used, you know, uh, used recursive search or arrowed up instead of, you know, retyping and forgot to change Vim to cat and lock the terminal up and we i got back in one one important thing i have to mention here is be cool it could happen it it has happened to chris it has happened to me during cks and it's not really pleasant the first reaction was to panic but really be calm if should so something like that happen to you i was completely disconnected PSI exited, and I was given the link to the survey, like I was on question 12 from 16 or 17. The way to approach this is just start PSI browser, eventually you'll be reconnected, and whatever time you have left, uh, focus and do as much as you can. For example, I was disconnected for maybe 10, 15 minutes, but then I was able to completely finish the CKS exam and pass it. So. Yeah, and I think even the proctors will give you warnings on time, right? So even if those, I think I, I recall like my proctor saying, hey, you have only got 30 minutes or whatever left because it was yeah. different from the actual timer. So they know how much time you have left and they can communicate that to you. Next one here is make sure you leave your clusters in working order. And one tip here is um, if you are asked to modify control plane uh, components, you know, modifying the static manifests, always do a backup. Just copy the file on a different path with some extension, either the same extension or with dot, uh, something, just to have a copy. Okay, so post exam tips is um, just some things to note about. When you're done with the exam, right? First off, congratulations because you know you that's something that was probably very stressful. So give yourself some rest. Uh, you've got 24 hours until you get those results, as we mentioned before. Once you've uh, passed the exam, then make sure that you uh, do a couple things: get your certificate from the foundation portal, especially for those of you who maybe are doing like a um, tuition reimbursement. Oftentimes they want to, you know, your organization, your company may want the actual certificate. So there is a PDF that you should know about uh, that you can download from the training portal. Um, secondarily, you will receive a badge from Credly for your achievement. So if you want to show off your achievement on like LinkedIn, and I would say, you know, along with being proud of yourself, help others, right, that are going through the same process. That's kind of why we're do we're here today because, you know, all, as the term says, all boats rise, right? So, you know, it's oftentimes helpful for someone else to feel good about the test if they know a little bit more information. So this is really excellent tip, Chris, and really thank you for adding that because community is what makes us stronger. And I just want to add up here that there is a Slack channel for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation that you can join. And there are really awesome people there. There are channels dedicated to the different exams. Although we are not allowed to disclose what exact question we've been asked throughout our exam, we can help others prepare for their, for their certification. We can share with them those tips and tricks and make them ex make their experience much more pleasant and you know hopefully uh, being able to pass from the first time all of the exams so uh, that is it for uh, our webinar and everything you need to know about the certifications uh, from the Linux Foundation and the CNCF and uh, we thanks thank you for your time and attention hopefully you learned some some good tips, uh, some information about these, uh, the different exams, and um, it helps you on your certification journey. Best of luck.